is a point where there's not enough fluid here to trigger the siphon. So you end up with a number of pods that are completely full and then the rest are empty. But if you reduce this threshold, lower this down until there's almost no siphon, no threshold, then they go on filling until the later ones are only partly full, until there's hardly anything in the last ones at all, exactly like the chickpea. And when I demonstrated this model to my colleagues in, in India, um, I and everybody else got what was going on straight away. And you could change the levels, you could move the height of the siphons, you could open and close the valves. <coughs> it was a much more informative model, and it helped us understand the physiological basis of pod set. And in fact, in plants, the sugars move around in tubes called the phloem, uh, and it really is a kind of hydrodynamical process. So modeling these processes hydrodynamically turns out to be much easier, much more comprehensible, uh, much more illuminating than, spending, uh, than hiring lots of people to try uh, write pages and pages of code, all of which depends on theoretical assumptions. And when you don't know much about the system, you don't know if you've got the right assumptions. This way you can do it by trial and error. Now, when I was um, thinking about this talk and, and um, th this modeling process, I was amazed to find uh, a paper that came out uh, in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society just two weeks ago called A Brief History of Liquid Computers uh, by um, Andrew Adamatsky, who's at the, inter it's called the Unconventional Computing Lab in the University of the West of England. And he discovered a whole series of other hydrodynamics of um, liquid com computation, which are very fascinating. Interestingly, there's a big fashion now for quantum computing. And quantum computing involves superposed quantum states. And quantum phenomena are wave phenomena. Basically, what's happening in quantum computing is a reinvention of analog computing. The problem with analog computing is that you have to have specific analog models. It's not like a generalized machine that can do everything. You have to make specific models. But now, if you look in Nature or other leading scientific journals, almost every two or three weeks, there's now a new analog computer model of chemical bonds, of molecular processes, and so on. Um, so I think, in fact, uh, there is uh, the beginning of a resurgence of analog computing. And even if we don't call it a computer, if we just call it uh, an analog model, um, I think that these water-based models um, are able to provide an enormous illumination uh, to many natural phenomena, which dense computer code and digital computers can't. So that's really what I wanted to say this morning, a, a, a fresh look at the world of computing and um, a, a, an appreciation of what we can learn from the dynamical properties of water, both through hyd hydrodynamical flows and through wave patterns. Thank you. When I watch your films, I see organs forming. Will it be possible to reverse engineer the morphic field so we can regenerate organs and limbs? Well, morphic fields are already um, underlying regeneration. I mean, huge numbers of regenerative processes occur already. You know, willow trees cut them up into hundreds of little bits, and each bit will grow a new tree. Flatworms cut them into 10 different particles and they'll each grow a new flatworm. So regeneration is already one of the major features of morphogenetic fields, that they are inherently regenerative. Of and course, the limit, there's a limit in, in us. Uh, the liver regenerates, the skin regenerates, the intestinal line or lining, the blood cells. Some things don't regenerate so much, but um, even we have quite considerable regenerative capacities. We're actually doing it all the time. We're doing it all the time. Mm. Questions?
Ja. Oh. Uh, so when I understand correctly, you um, made movies uh, of frequencies from 15 until 200 hertz, right? Yes. Of London drinking water? No, pur purified water. Purified water. So, because uh, our body's frequency is um, not the frequency of uh, the Wi-Fi, for example, uh, did you go, uh, or can you imagine what will happen when you go into very high frequencies? Because now it's all very pretty. Will it be very ugly when you do very high frequencies? Well, uh, the person who danced that better than me is John Stuart Reed, because he builds three different cymoscopes, one low frequency, below 50 hertz, one medium frequency, 50 to 200, the one that I've been talking about, and then one with higher frequencies. Um, but the, what you need, you have to have smaller containers. The, for the high frequency one, it's only about a centimeter across. The patterns you get depend on the diameter as well as the fluid that you're using. So, um, I mean, the patterns in his high frequency cymoscope are still very attractive. It depends on having a smaller diameter. I mean, I don't know how high he's gone. We'll, we can ask him. Um, but, um, so, I, you know, I think the same principles apply. It's just that you have to change the diameter. I can't. Uh, well, I think so, if you'd have a very small container. I, mean, it, I don't think high frequencies are uh, bad in themselves or anything. I think it's all, that all frequencies would, would actually produce these kinds of patterns, but it depends on the size. It, the high frequencies are smaller scale. Thank you very much, Rupert, for such an illuminating lecture. <coughs> we are talking here a lot about memory of water. And I believe that memory of water and mor morphogenetic fields are somehow related to each other. Yes. Now, what uh, it can define the stability of the mor morphogenetic field and its change? I mean, how it may c can take, uh, keep memory for uh, how long period of time and how to uh, erase this memory? Well, I, of course, obviously, uh, in these experiments, I was interested to see if there was a memory in the water itself. And whether there was a memory carrying over from one pattern to another. And with the cymoscope, I wasn't sure whether this would show a morphic resonance effect or not, because we're dealing here with forced vibrations. And in living systems and molecular systems, we're dealing with spontaneous vibra or patterns generated from within. These, I think, in these forced vibration systems, we haven't found clear memory effects. We've found some hysteresis effects in, in fluids after vibrating the short-term <coughs> hysteresis. The patterns will appear quicker in the same fluid after a short time lag. Um, but we haven't, at least in the frequencies we've worked with, found uh, memory effects. Now, this is a very... We're blasting these systems with high energy um, waves, um, high energy vibrations, uh, we're not going to detect any subtle memory effects using this system. Um, so I can't, I can't answer the question as to whether there are subtle memory effects. This doesn't show, this, this isn't, because it's such an enormous amount of energy you're putting in, you have to put it in above a threshold to get Faraday waves. Uh, smaller vibrations won't produce Faraday waves. It has to go beyond a fairly high amplitude to get the the Faraday instability that produces these waves. And what if to use homeopathic intensity of vibrations? Hmm? Well, you can't see patterns in these cymoscopes with very low intensity of vibration. You only see it with quite high. And later on, after this? I don't know whether we haven't tried uh, whether there's homeopathic effects. I wouldn't know how to assay that. <laughs> hmm. Uh, Rupert, oh, thank you. yes. Um, since you're a biologist, and biologists don't contain, biology doesn't contain purified water, have you ever tried looking at different waters with different mineral contents, or for that matter, structured water? 
Yes, uh, we tried seawater and we've tried artificial plasma. Um, we got very similar results. It changes the, um, the frequency at which things happen. Um, we've also tried a series of alcohols, um, you, know, pen, you know, butyl alcohol, isopropanol, um, methanol, etc. Um, they show very much the same patterns, the same free series of patterns that we get with water. It's just that the frequency you need to elicit them is shifted. So that, like that graph I showed, the whole thing is very similar. It's just shifted one way or the other, depending on whether you've got solutes in the water or whether you're using alcohols or alcohol water mixtures. So the, these patterns we're seeing are not actually specific to water. They're to do with liquids and with the surface tension we found out that the main variable that affects the patterns and their frequency response is the surface tension, which fits with the kind of drum skin model, the Bessel function model, that we're basically vibrating a membrane. Uh, I appreciate the, excuse me, I'm, I'm here. Oh yes, I'm here. Right. Rodolfo Fiorini from Politecnico Milano. I appreciate uh, uh, your emphasis on uh, uh, um, uh, analog computer and digital computers, and uh, your reference to fluidic computers for uh, uh, military application, and there was a research funded by NATO uh, 40 or 50 years ago, and they dropped that, that, uh, that approach for reliability. And in fact, now they use fly-by-wire. Uh, so, uh, uh, just to, to tell you something that maybe we miss, uh, or mathematic, mathematic uh, people miss an opportunity to understand better how numbers work into a computer. And they applied the past mathematics approach to digital computers. And so that's the problem that you emphasized with an, 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 uh, mm -hmm. analog computers. But maybe that today we have a new understanding of the kind of playing, and so maybe that uh, with the digital computer we'll be able to do something comparable to the past ones? Possibly. Um, but I still think that analog computers would have a big advantage in the sense that they, if, it, well, if you're trying to model biological processes which are indeterminate, um, um, analog uh, systems can be naturally indeterminate, whereas with digital computers, you'd have to sort of build it in by pseudo-random algorithms. So, um, yes, I mean, I'm, my point is not that this is going to replace digital computing, but that uh, for certain applications, analog computing and analog modeling are very, very useful and much more easy to understand. Thanks to this uh, digital device, we are right on time. Uh, Beverly. Uh, Dr. Sheldrake is very approachable. I'm sure you can ask your question of him. And uh, time to move on. Yes. Thank you. Um, Thank you for a wonderful discussion. Do you have your point? So we, we keep continuing our journey from this very aesthetic and very elite scientific aspects and elite scientific or artistic aspects. So we are not leaving the cymoscope. We actually, I'm very pleased to introduce you to John Stuart Reed, who is the inventor and the creator of the cymoscope. And he will uh, inform us additional information, provide us additional information on how sound is made visible and how do he does it, especially to visualize 3D information like ultrasounds and dolphin experiments, how they see via sound waves. So I'm very much pleased and hand on the mic microphone to you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, we just need to get the PowerPoint set up first. If you can uh, give me a little bit of uh, assistance here because we have a uh, discard, I think. Yeah, I think we're okay. Just, just close this. Yeah, close this. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Open this one. Uh, this one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, we're good. So, uh, present a view. Uh, yeah. 
No, open it. Yeah. Presentation book? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Again, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, thank Professor Pollack, not only for his kind invitation for me to present to you today, but also for having the vision to create this wonderful conference all those years ago. And you know, for Annalise and me, this is our third time visiting the conference, and uh, it feels like a family. And you know, with, with most families, there's some level of dysfunction. <laughs> but with this family, it's hard to imagine any family that has less dysfunction, actually. So, so thank you so much, Professor Pollack. So, sound is an aspect of life, but is life an aspect of sound? Well, it's a very interesting question, isn't it? And uh, one that I'd like to explore today. But just before I begin, I uh, kind of cast my mind back 35 years to an exhibition that I attended in Münster, north of Germany. And in this exhibition, w one of the things that really caught my eye were acrylic tubes. These things were standing like two meters tall, probably, I don't know, 15 centimeters diameter, something like that, filled with water. And in the bottom of the tube, uh, some little pump that was pumping air into the tube. So the tube was filled with these beautiful bubbles that were rising. And of course, as they rose and the pressure decreased, the bubbles got larger in uh, diameter and so on. I was absolutely fascinated by these bubbles. And I've been fascinated by bubbles ever since. And some years ago, uh, I happened on the, this uh, hypothesis concerning life in the primordial oceans regarding uh, bubbles. So it's a journey that really began 35 years ago. And so here we are today talking about bubbles. And abiogenesis. So I'm going to introduce a subject now before we actually get into the main part of this presentation, um, which again, it concerns water, of course, and it also concerns an aspect of water which you're probably all very, well, I know you'll all be very familiar with, and that is um, the innocent pleasure of throwing a pebble into a pond. When we do this, uh, we see these beautiful concentric ripples that rush away across the pond, taking the information in that uh, little plop sound across to the far end, edge of the pond, pond or the lake, wherever we, are, we happen to be. And, uh, but there's all sorts of hydrodynamic aspects to this that we can't see. Before I just go on to those, let's just say, if you have a romantic bone in your body, and you're there at the side of the pond or the lake uh, with your beloved, something really wonderful you can do is to each throw a pebble at approximately the same moment. And when they, these two little plop sounds occur, you can then stand there holding hands and watching as the energy from one bubble merges with the energy from the other, and you get this beautiful uh, intermixing of the two uh, concentric waves, creating sort of diamond patterns. It's a very romantic thing to do, and Annalise and I often do that. But there's lots of hydro hydrodynamic aspects to this, of course, that we can't see. One of the interesting aspects to it is the speed of propagation. You know, how, what, what, what aspect of physics is causing that particular speed? Well, of course, it's the, the viscosity of the, of the fluid, in this, in this case, water. But the other thing that happens, and I've shown this in the lab, and we've actually photographed it, is you get a tube torus created in the subsurface of the water. I, di I didn't bring a photograph today to show you, but perhaps I should have done. But you do get a tube torus under the water. And even though classical physics says uh, that water is not easily compressed, in fact, you know, we have the evidence that, that sound does in fact compress water to the extent that the refractive index is changed just a little bit, but enough with powerful lighting to be able to actually see that happen. So we, tube toruses also happen. But 
Now, I want you to imagine the, these ripples that are rushing away across the water's surface. There's nothing to prevent them rushing away. You know, there's no impedance excepting the general viscosity of the water. But what happens, what would happen if there was something that prevented that, the ripple, ripples rushing away across the water? Well, a little while ago, I was contacted by a, a Japanese friend of mine, Ritsuko Fujimori, and um, she wanted to have an art project. In, she's a photographer. She wanted to have an art project in which she was she wanted to photograph um, bubbles in a, a, in a river. So she asked my advice. What do you think I should do? How, what camera shutter speed should I use? And this sort of, uh, these sort of questions. And one of the things I said was, well, if you photograph water, uh, turbulent water, you're almost certainly going to see simulacrums. You know, these are shapes in nature which resemble something else. And so she did this, actually, and um, she saw all sorts of wonderful things in the water, like angels and birds and butterflies and all these different shapes that, you know, that, we, that we imagine when we, uh, when we see these kind of simulacrums in nature. But the other thing that I suggested to her was that um, if you use a really fast shutter speed, I'm going to predict that you will see Faraday wave patterns in some of the bubbles. You're going to have to be lucky because they, go, they only last, theoretically, very short periods of time, a few milliseconds at most. But if you're lucky and you just happen to shut, open the shutter and close the shutter at that right moment, you will see Faraday wave patterns. And she, and she actually did achieve this. And so here are some of the patterns that she saw. Here's one that we kind of call an hourglass, not an hourglass, rather a sundial, beg your pardon. And there are others. Here's another one. Why did these occur? Well, they're occurring because when a little splash of water comes out, say it strikes a rock or something, a little splash comes out and plops into the water. That is a sound, of course, it's sonic energy, that tries to escape, it tries to propagate away, but it can't because of the turbulence in the water. So that turbulence actually prevents uh, an impedance, a resistance, to the little wavelets that are trying to escape, and they come back and they create Faraday wave patterns. And I believe, if any of you know different, please tell me, but I believe that you're probably the first people ever to see these patterns in water. If you know different, please tell me. I may, I may be a little bit disappointed, but not too much. There's another one there. I don't know how clear they are to see, but... And then there's one more. I love this particular one because it reminds me so much of what Rupert was saying about radiolaria. Can you see this one has a little spike coming out of it? And, and it's got so much structure in it there. Anyway, I thought you'd find that interesting. And you may be the first people ever to see images, apart from Ritsuko and Annalise and myself. So, moving on. So, bubbles. I'm not showing you any of the angels. That would be for Ritsuko. Actually, I think she's going to publish a book, and um, I really look forward to that book and seeing all her angels and butterflies. So I'm going to give you a very quick overview. Um, I, I mentioned this in my presentation last year. Very quick uh, overview. Hydrothermal bubbles, there's not hydrothermal vents. There's not much um, controversy around the the idea, the concept that life emerged around hydrothermal vents. I know some other scientists in, in history have suggested that they might have emerged in warm little pools and so on, but nevertheless, the mainstream view is, is hydrothermal vents. And I think for a very good reason, because the conditions are ideal in many ways. First of all, we've got the bubbles, of course, that are coming from the gases that are emerging into this creates broad sound band sound, if you analyze it on an FFT analyzer, you will see it contains thousands of frequencies, uh, audio frequencies, you know, right from very, very low frequencies way up into the, uh, into, actually into low ultrasound levels, uh, frequency ranges. And the wonderful thing about this is that nature has a way of selecting the frequencies depending on the size of the bubble. 
because each bubble acts as a kind of Helmholtz resonator. You know, it contains a particular volume of gas, um, and the bubble itself selects its frequency from this melee of sounds that are being created by, uh, by the vents. The point about this is that when each bubble selects its particular frequency, on the surface of the bubble, there has to be a Faraday wave pattern. There just has to be, because the, the bubble itself is resonant with that particular frequency, and the surface membrane of that bubble acts as a means of manifesting those frequencies in terms of a Faraday wave pattern. And we have uh, managed to actually image many of these patterns in the lab, and I showed you some of the images uh, in last year's presentation. But one of the things that uh, I think is so important about this particular hypothesis is that when you introduce vibration into a bubble, first thing that happens is a pattern does appear on the surface, but then the bubble also becomes um, almost lifelike in its behavior. And of course, one of the other things that we know from Professor Pollack's work is that the interior surface of that bubble um, contains a, a lot of electricity. So there's an electric aspect to bubbles as well. So let us just uh, start this video and show you what happens. So what I'm going to do is introduce a 21 hertz uh, vibration or sound into this small cuvette. And this cuvette is a uh, two and a half centimeters across, it's square format. Watch what happens when I increase the amplitude level. They start to move around, they start to, it's as almost as though they're chasing each other around this little cuvette and I bring the amplitude down, then start to bring it up again and again they chase each other around. And you also notice that the tiny little bubbles up here at the top, for example, they're doing nothing. They're ignoring this 21 hertz frequency. Why? Because they're not resonant with it. If I increase the frequency of excitation, then the, the large bubbles stop moving and the small bubbles start to move around the cuvette instead. A very good demonstration of resonance. But of course, the, also, the other interesting thing about this is that this cymatic pattern or this Faraday wave pattern that appears on the surface of the bubble. And why is that important in relation to abiogenesis? Well, you know, the, the, there are many theories, and I'm going to go through some of them a little bit later in this presentation, but um, of the many theories concerning how life uh, began, some relating to uh, comets, you know, bringing all sorts of uh, material from outer space into the oceans of Earth, uh, other, other methods by which these compounds, uh, hide, uh, these uh, organic compounds can be formed in the oceans and so on. But, but overlying all of this is, okay, so we have, we have the building blocks of life in the water, now how are they going to suddenly come together to form life? That's a really big question, isn't it? And nobody seems to have a really good answer for it. But one particular uh, idea that may resonate with you is this idea that these Faraday wave patterns on the surface of bubbles represent a model, a way that the building blocks of life can actually come together in a coherent way, in an organized way, and a way to actually form some kind of a pattern of these uh, prebiotic uh, chemicals. And recently we were honored by a visit from Professor Brian Josephson, and uh, this was the comment that he made. That he loved this video, by the way, of the bubbles, and he said that this may help to clarify the way intelligence emerges in nature. Uh, a really interesting comment, and um, because he's particularly interested in t intelligent design, which I'll mention a little bit later. And just to mention about the about the uh, Faraday wave patterns on the surface of bubbles. You see here um, what I term sonic scaffolding. 
in terms of uh, the modes of bubbles. These are uh, uh, bu uh, bubble models that are shown from a wonderful book um, called The Acoustic Bubble. And, um, and this shows the, some of the primary modes of bubbles, but of course, the, the kind of sounds that I'm talking about are highly complex, they're, they're not necessarily primary modes. They could be really complex modes. And I'd like to show you a quick video now that I think is, a, is quite instructive in many ways. Oh, go back. Here we go. This is in the space station. We need some sound, please. Didgeridoos and oscillation of spheres of water. It's a good thing we have towels set up all around here <laughs> to catch these flying drops. And watch this. Now, I'm going to make these big, and they're not going to spall off as much water now. That's kind of interesting. also very interesting to see how the size of the spheres is affected by the tone. So the spheres are, are tuned and you can excite a mode in those and it's dependent upon the tone as well. So it's an interesting mix of science, music, a little bit of culture and uh, a little bit of uh, cleaning supplies from board space station. So uh, anyways, it's, uh, it's uh, always an interesting, um, interesting exercise to look at all the things around you and try to look at them in a different way. Very interesting that, isn't it? And, and notice how, did you notice that the small droplets are not being affected at all by that quite powerful low frequency sound that he was generating there with a vacuum tube, a vacuum cleaner tube, making it sound uh, like a, a didgeridoo or yudaki. But the low frequencies are not, uh, are not impacting at all on those little droplets. They're just sitting there kind of ignoring it. Of course, if you were to measure the energy entering those droplets, you'd find it's exactly the same energy levels entering the large droplets, excepting the small ones are ignoring it and say, no, we're not resonant with you, you know, so they're just ignoring it. But the large droplets, you notice that pattern that was forming, because you can't see the structure in that pattern with that kind of single point lighting that they are using, um, but in fact there will be a beautiful pattern forming on that sessile drop. So moving on. So, um, in February 1872, Charles Darwin wrote to the botanist Joseph Hooker, speculating that life evolved in some warm little pond. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, phosphoric salts, light, heat, and electricity. Because uh, there's a lot of controversy these days about evolution. You know, and even Darwin himself knew, he knew, and he actually wrote in his, in his wonderful book that uh, he only had part of the answer, you know, that um, he didn't have all of the answers. And many people today are suggesting that there was an intelligence in, uh, in the whole business of creation of life. And this is a, one of the many books that are talking about this by uh, Stephen Mayer about intelligent design, and you heard earlier that uh, Brian Josephson is extremely interested in this concept. And I think the reason for it is because uh, when we see the complexities of life, it's so hard to imagine that all of that complexity could have arisen without some kind of an intelligence, right? I think it's a reasonable, a reasonable thought. A theory of intelligent design is not based on religion, but uh, instead, it's based on evidence, scientific evidence theory about life origins that challenges strictly materialistic views of evolution. That was by Stephen Mayer. And then what I'm saying is, but what if? 
and organizational forces discovered that can begin to account for the complexity of life, a force that can be viewed to have innate intelligence without the need for intelligent design, right? Interesting idea. Because, you know, if we can identify that force and we can actually see some of the evidence for that force in nature, then perhaps we don't need to look for intelligent design. Now, this, uh, Rupert showed earlier, you know, some uh, radiolaria and uh, diatoms and so on. And I'd like to point out now that all of these different uh, shapes here can be created on the cymoscope. Literally, you just tune in. You have to know which frequencies to tune in. Some of them require more than one frequency, like a high frequency and a low frequency. And when they mix and mingle, you get these various shapes. And you saw you know, some of that with uh, Lauterfasser's excellent video earlier with the bubble and how it forms into a shape that looks like a, a living creature. All of those shapes can be created, and a lot more. Uh, I showed some of these last year. There's a few more here just to show you. There's a trilobite from 526 million years ago. You know, the image on the left there, the cymatic image or the Faraday wave image, is so strikingly similar. Here's a starfish, again, strikingly similar. Here's a diatom, strikingly similar. And this, another form of diatom. I mean, it, in fact, you know, you'd have to be a real expert in this fossilized area to know which is the cymatic pattern and which is the, the life form. <laughs> so that's why I, I put the word cymatic image there, just so that you know for sure which one's which. Here's another one. I mean, look at all these beautiful little antinodes around the periphery and so on. You know, we could, I could show these all day, but you get the idea that it seems that there is a link between sound and life. One of my uh, scientific heroes is Sir Fred Hoyle, and uh, he, with uh, Dr. Chandra Wickrama Singh, found evidence of prebiotic molecules in spectrographic data from ice clouds in space, and further evidence of carbonaceous chondrites, a species of, of uh, meteorite. And you probably know that these carbonaceous chondrites, they have so many different um, prebiotic uh, chemicals on them. And, and even, you know, you could even say uh, fossilized evidence of life. And there's some conjecture, of course, about that, whether, real, whether they really are fossilized life forms from space. But certainly there's no question from spectrographic data and from these carbonaceous chondrites that many of the building blocks necessary for life were brought to Earth by meteorites. And um, there's Sir Fred Hoyle with uh, Dr. Chandra uh, from many years ago, of course. Uh, Fred Hoyle is no longer with us, but, uh, but uh, Dr. Chandra Wickrama Singh is indeed with us. And here he is. And he says, to ignore the evidence for panspermia, which is you know, the word that he uses, to maintain without any proof whatsoever that planet-bound abiogenesis, whether on Earth or Mars, is the only permissible way to understand the phenomenon of life is an error that might have adverse implications for the future of science. Because in this field that we're talking about, abiogenesis, there's much conflict about where life emerged. You know, did it emerge first on Earth or did it emerge in space and was brought to, light, brought to Earth and so on? Well, some of the uh, evidence now, of course, points to Comet 67P because this audacious mission of the European Space Agency was so successful. You know, they landed a spacecraft on a comet traveling at thousands of miles an hour and, uh, and actually, uh, with a mass spectrometer, sampled the dust on the surface of the comet. I mean, what an audacious undertaking. But from the data, they saw all of these many different, um, there's a paper on the subject detailing all of the compounds that were found, the organic compounds, on the surface of a comet traveling through space. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? 
Um, but anyway, it's true. You know, there, there is the data. And um, I'm not going to read all of this, but you know, the, the, the key aspect of this is the complexity of cometary nucleus chemistry and the importance of N-containing organics imply that the early solar system chemistry fosters the formation of prebiotic material in noticeable concentrations. Many other wonderful papers on this subject. If, you, if this has inspired you to start you know, looking into this uh, area of science, I can recommend many different papers to you. Here's one of them. And one, of this, one of the reasons I mentioned this particular one is because of the lipids uh, that are sometimes found on these carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. And of course, lipids are a key component of the membranes of, uh, of cells. There's another one. I love the this title of this paper, uh, Origin of Life from Chaos to Orderliness. Because, you know, if anything can create order from chaos, it is sound. And, you know, you saw it in, in Rupert's wonderful presentation. And I see it virtually every day in the lab working with the cymoscope. So here's a, a protocell um, that is showing lipids that are literally surrounding, a, um, a, uh, surrounding the cell. And the point about this is that these lipids that may have been brought to Earth by these carbonaceous chondrites can be organized on the surface of a bubble so, simply because of sound. So although there, there are no integral membrane proteins being shown or anything of that nature, we can imagine, we can well imagine that sound has this ability to organize the lipids and indeed to create other forms that can penetrate through those lipids into the interior of the protocell. And we don't necessarily need to believe or to even consider that life emerged spontaneously. It could have evolved over a long period of time. We don't have to imagine that life, uh, in the sense of replicable life, a replication, emerged instantly in any sense. It could have been a protocell that simply lived in, in the sense of, a, of a, like a virus lives, or the, you know, some people say that viruses are not alive, some people say, well, they are kind of, because they exhibit some of the qualities of life. So, you know, I think that it may have been that protocells, these kind of protocells, didn't replicate. They lived, if we can call it life, and then they died, and then more were produced, and more were produced, and then eventually, through eons of time, other mechanisms were brought into this uh, puzzle. Again, probably through sound as this primordial organizer. And, you know, I've called it sonic scaffolding. Um, amphiphilic molecules may have taken the first stage in the creation of cellular life. The next step needed is a mechanism that can organize formless building blocks into regular morphologies to create orderliness from chaos. Enter sonic scaffolding. Uh, just mentions, uh, obviously, by uh, Dr. Stanley Miller and Yuri. Um, and uh, going back to what I said earlier, you know, okay, you, you, you can, if you put these various um, chemicals into a flask and you spark them for a couple of days, you will create all sorts of complex uh, organic or semi-organic materials, building blocks, right? So, but were these building blocks, um, how, how would these building blocks organized into life? That's, that's the big question. I want to show you something now very, very interesting. Uh, it's this here. Uh, Robert Brown, the famous uh, uh, botanist, uh, of course, um, from which we get Brownian motion. We all know what Brownian motion is, right? Um, and it was modeled by Albert Einstein. Uh, I want to show you this video of Brownian motion very quickly. This is uh, sent to me by Paul Baker. These are lipids in water. And you see the, you see the vibration of the lipids. They're being bombarded. 
Now, the standard model, of course, of this is that this proved the existence of atoms and molecules and so on, and that these little uh, droplets, in this case, are being moved by, um, simply by the number of impacts, which is, you know, what Einstein predicted. But, enter Professor Pollack's wonderful book, The Fourth Phase of Water, there may be another explanation uh, adjunct to this, which is EZ water comes into the equation. And for those of you who have not read the book, probably not many of you here haven't read it, but if you haven't read it, I really recommend you to read it in relation to Brownian motion, because it's a key element in, uh, in, in how life began in the primordial oceans. And there's the, uh, the famous Einstein equations relating to Brownian motion. But there's so much missing from those equations, as uh, Professor Pollack points out. It's not a complete theory. So whatever natural phenomena is eventually discovered to be the true mechanism that underpins Brownian motion, when sound enters water, dynamic Faraday wave results in banishment of the jitterbug chaos, creating exquisite order, certain aspects of which may involve exclusion zones. And here, this beautiful image is simply sound in water, creating that order from Brownian motion, essentially. And here, I'm going to show you something really quite extraordinary. It's, uh, if I can get this video to start, Professor Tadashi Tokida. If you ask real experts in probability, they'll say this is not random because it's far too uniform. You know, really, Poisson, that kind of thing would have more gaps and so forth. But it's random enough. And what I'm about to show you works with any sufficiently random dots. OK. Now, I photocopy this on a transparency, the exact copy. I put one on top of the other. The result is this interestingly boring, shall I say, really amazingly boring. But now let's shift the transparency against the bottom sheet a little bit. And what you see is this. Isn't that amazing? You see those concentric circles around a common center. And the reason, actually, in retrospect, is not too surprising, because whatever I'm doing to the transparency is a Euclidean motion. And we know that Euclidean motion in 2D is always a rotation. Actually, it could be a translation, but the translation is like a rotation with the center at infinity. So it's always a rotation. So you see um, those um, traces of rotation, so to speak, under your eyes. Now, the, what's happening is that you see the original random dots are displaced slightly, and the image is a close enough to the original dots. And when you have a situation like that, human eyes cannot help connecting the dots. You know, those are, dots are connected, and you see those small segments in your eyes, and then you see those trajectories of the rotation. So he's saying you can't help but see that, uh, that pattern emerging. He's saying it's an illusion, and indeed, obviously, it is an illusion, but I think there's a more dynamic aspect to it as well. And I just want to show you one last video, which I think will uh, be very instructive. 43.43 hertz. So there's 43.43 hertz. We're now going into the low frequency cymoscope. This cuvette's about 50 millimeters in diameter. Gradually increasing the amplitude until we reach the point of Faraday um, instability. And so we create this beautiful Faraday wave pattern. It's quite difficult to see on this, but you see, first of all, you notice that rotation and re remembering what Tadashi, Professor Tadashi just showed us about rotation. So when there's a slight phase shift, you see this order emerging. And here we have, um, it's actually the reason for this slight phase shift in terms of the cymoscope is because there's a second frequency being introduced. So we've got the primary frequency, and we have a secondary frequency, just a couple of hertz, that's causing that rotational phase shift. And uh, but the other thing that perhaps you can't see so well on that image, on that video there, is the beautiful shimmering effect that you get in the background. And the reason that I think that shimmering effect occurs is because when the sonic energy um, radiates out, it reaches the boundary where it meets some exclusion zone water, right, at the boundary. Well, it's inevitable that when the reflection of energy goes back to the epicenter, 
that it carries with it some of that exclusion zone water. And when it does so, we now know that exclusion zone water has a slightly different refractive index to uh, bulk water. And so you can imagine the light coming down from the light ring, striking the water. It's now seeing bulk water, but it's also seeing this slightly different refractive index water. And so this is how you get this beautiful, we think anyway, how you get this beautiful shimmering effect. I had some more slides, but you know, I don't want to um, break the tradition of me being able to finish my presentation. So we'll leave it at that for the time being. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful excursion to the phenomenology of life, because you really shared some aspects, some very Thank important you so aspects. Much. And before we hop into one or two questions, because we don't have that much time, may I start straight off with one brief um, question that it's intriguing to see these oscillatory mode and then compare that to Cyril Smith's work in the 1980s when he started to see membrane oscillations in the megahertz, gigahertz, terahertz range. So where do you think do these Electrodynamic oscillation modes fit to the acoustic oscillation modes. I'm sorry, I didn't really understand your question. That Cyril, Cyril Smith discovered that yes. oscillatory modes on the membrane, the cytosolic structure, the organelles, they're all kind of a, if you do the Fourier transformation, you see a spectrum of oscillatory frequencies in the electrodynamic oscillation modes. So where do you see these in relation to your acoustic oscillation okay, modes? Okay, I, I now understand. Thank you okay. so much. Well, um, one of the interesting aspects, of course, of the acoustic Faraday waves that we are seeing here is that there's also an electromagnetic component to them. Why is this? Well, because um, when molecules of water are uh, vibrated by sound, what we have here are phonon-phonon interactions. Mm. So we have, in a sense, we have inelastic collisions that are occurring between the water molecules. And these inelastic collisions have to, by definition, uh, radiate some energy. And of course, that energy will, at these kind of pressure levels that we're talking about, sound pressure levels, will create infrared uh, light. And the light that's created, the infrared energy that's being created, has to be modulated by that sound that we've, we've injected. So we now have the combination of sound, audible sounds, plus we have infrared that's modulated by those sounds. And I believe, you know, in, in, uh, in answer to your question, that there's um, a huge area of science that has not yet been explored here in relation to infrared being created by all of these inelastic collisions that are occurring in our physiology all of the time, of course, you know. So um, I hope that partially answers your question. Hello. Hello. Sorry, that's a little loud. <laughs> um, I guess in a potential future, it's a very hypothetical question, but um, what do you see as the possible limits of a possible technology where we could create um, form with sound, maybe add in some light, and basically start to, in essence, create life forms? Does that make sense? That we could artificially create life forms in the future? Like, yeah. <laughs> wow. A little That's far a, out, I guess. But <laughs> well, you know, nothing's impossible. Or some people say nothing's impossible. Um, I think we're a very, very long way from that. But it's an interesting uh, postulate. And, you know, the fact that we see all of these what look like living forms in water. And by the way, you know, these living, some of these living forms that I've been showing you today... They're not static. I mean, okay, I'm showing you these as static images, right? But when I see them with my eyes in the, in the water, they're dynamic. And they look like they're alive, just as you saw with that Lauterwasser image, for example, that video, rather. Um, they look like they're living. So it's really hard to imagine that there is no connection, that it's all just imaginary. You know, I, I really do think that there is a, a connection between life and sound. So thank you for your question. So, the last two questions. One is over here, and the last one over there. Okay. Uh, I just have a comment to make that you uh, said that uh, sound could be the, the origin of life, whatever it is. Well, the Bible tells us that God created not so much with his hands, but by speaking. So that God, God created by speaking. Oh, so yes. That, so that uh, uh, the, even though 
so you could have the intelligent design, but it was still by the use of sound because he did it by speaking. Yes, I, I, I know that, uh, that spiritual tradition. And of course, there are many spiritual traditions that speak of, uh, of sound having been involved in creation. For example, uh, I'm an amateur Egyptologist and, uh, you know, the god Ptah uh, said, spoke the world into being. Uh, it's one of many, many traditions that we know about. And one of the other aspects of, uh, of sound at the beginning of the universe, uh, if we all believe in the Big Bang aspect of creation, is of course there was a very big sound pressure. Uh, and at one, one of the models, one of the mainstream models of cosmology is that why we see galaxy, uh, groups of galaxies in different places in the universe with huge gaps in between is because of sound at the very beginning of the universe. And that this pressure wave, if we can call it that, or pressure bubble that emerged from the Big Bang is, that, is the reason. The little quantum differences in that pressure caused the matter to be grouped into different areas of the universe. And in, and in that theory, uh, or that model, sound was far more powerful than gravity or any of the other forces right at the beginning of the universe. And apparently, uh, according to the model, lasted for 370,000 years before other forces took over and started to organize matter in different ways. Thank you for your question. Ah, okay. uh, hello, hello, I'm Sylvie uh, Henri Réan. Um, I would say, what about the Wi-Fi? Because our cells are about 20 micrometer uh, to 40 micrometer, and when you have a huge uh, Wi-Fi influence on them, I, should, I think you should have interesting patterns at the surface and in the cells, because it's the right size from all the communication technology. Do you have uh, an idea what can, how it can affect our cells on the models that you just explained to us? So what is, sorry, what is your question? My question is, what is your idea about the, the problems that I just uh, evoke? I'm sorry, I didn't it's, understand it. I mean, the Wi-Fi. Wi the Wi-Fi. Wi yeah. uh, yes. Uh, the communication, the Wi-Fi, when you yes. get the computer, you've got the Wi-Fi. Uh -huh. And the Wi-Fi is uh, uh, waves on the gigahertz range yeah. to the my, my, mega wave. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a huge uh, band, and you know, I, I won't explain you how the communication goes. I hope, suppose you know. And uh, <clears throat> if you have a, a cell which is 20 micrometers to 40 micrometers, that's about our cells. Obviously, because our cells are uh, piezoelectric, the, the waves become sound waves around the cells and can reorganize our cells on different patterns, as you show. And I just ask you what you think of this problem. Oh, okay. Based on what you just explained to us. Very briefly, please. Okay, it's a very big question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so um, electromagnetism and sound, of course, are completely different phenomena. Um, they're different phenomena. Basically, I have noticed effects with the cymoscope. I've been doing uh, various experiments with uh, homeopathy, for example, and where we have uh, signals that are remaining in the water and that show a, a specific effect in the Faraday waves that there's an interaction there in the water that we can actually see and quantify. So um, I think in the future there will be uh, experimental evidence that shows the results of the interaction between electromagnetism and sound, but I still say that they are different phenomena. Thank you. In the Thank future, there will be coffee. <laughs> yes. So and uh, let's, uh, we return at 10.45. Thank you. Thank you very much. 10.45, return. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you for...